Good morning, people of God. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ on this wonderful day, this Pentecost Sunday where we gather together to remember the birth of the church, the gifting of the Holy Spirit, the transformation of the disciples' hearts, and through them the transformation of the world. We come not only to celebrate that, looking back, but also to live that out. And we are here to worship God, to praise His name, to witness to our own faith, and to bless one another in fellowship in the midst of the Holy Spirit. And we pray it's a meaningful time of worship and connection for everyone gathered here and those on the internet. If you're a newcomer in our midst, we pray God's blessings on you. We hope that there are, if you have any answers that we can uh, give you about what we do here or who we are, what we're about, we'll be happy to, uh, if you, to give those answers to you if you ask, to get to know you a little better and to come alongside you in life. If there are ministry needs you have, we'd love to be with you in that. And for those who are gathered with us today or who might gather with us in the future who are watching, a reminder that as we come to communion today, this is not a Lutheran table. It's definitely not Hope's table. This is the Lord's table of grace. All of God's people, all who are dependent on God's grace in life, are welcome and encouraged to come and feast on God's grace at this family table. We're glad you're here. We have a few announcements for this week. I'm going to start out letting you know about a couple of deaths that have taken place in our congregation. Al Gutnick passed away on the 18th of this month. Memorial services are planned for Al on the 30th, just a few weeks away, the 30th at 11 a.m. here at Hope. We ask for God's grace and mercy to be showered upon Phyllis and the rest of the family and that you would encourage her with prayer and with love and with support as you see her. And then secondly, we need to let you know of the passing of Marianne Zielinski, who passed away on the 17th of this month. It's not a name that's familiar to most anyone here um, because she didn't attend here. She's actually the wife of Norb, who is the, uh, the organist and pianist at St. John Lutheran Church up the road that we're emerging with. And um, she passed away, and, uh, and we're supporting him in this time. We, he's been working with our pastors. We've gotten to know him as we've done pulpit supply and pastoral care. We were doing pastoral care for him because um, he fell and injured his knee and was looking forward to surgery. And then she, because of some complications to treatments, um, now has passed away. And so we've been walking with her family through a difficult time. We ask prayers upon them as well and for your support as you get to know him um, over the next few months. Uh, she is a Roman Catholic uh, and we're having a Catholic service, but has asked, he has asked for prayers from our community for him and for the family. We're not just a, a church that looks at these things and, and supports people in these times. We're also a church that wants to proactively celebrate life and to support those in need in life. So we have several opportunities to do that. One is a wonderful time of uplifting. So how many of you like to eat? <laughs> Tuesday night, or, or Tuesday, I should say, evening and night, or afternoon and night, at Texas Roadhouse is the dine out to donate um, time, where 10% of your bill, if you mark the little thing for them, 10% of your bill is given back by them to a charity of our choice. And the way we've been selecting those charities is by having little ballots there at the dinner um, so that when you go, you can pick one up as you go in, and you can fill out where you want it to go. And whichever, um, whichever charity gets the most votes gets the money for that month. So it's a wonderful way to do that and to be involved. But it's also just a great time of fellowship. I love walking around and picking on you guys, if I'm honest. I love seeing you and picking on everyone. It's a good time. So uh, consider going there with friends, family, enjoy yourselves, but also help a good cause. Also available are um, some tickets in the Narthex, uh, one for the weekly Wednesday night dinners. Those are always available out there. There's also, are there also tickets available in the Narthex for the um, charity Bunko event that's being held at Seabreeze? Um, however, there is an error. You'll notice the proper day um, on the tickets and on the signs there. It says in the newsletter it's on the 23rd. That's not correct. It is on the 24th. So that's important. Make sure you mark that. It's on the 24th of this month. No, that's a Thursday. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, we have an, a special event coming up. Um, we have two uh, youth choirs coming to, uh, to worship with us and to lead us in song and have a good time with the first of those is June 17th. The next is the following day. June 17th is also Father's Day, if that helps you uh, in your mental calendar. But the kids coming for that program, which we're very excited about, we've had them before, um, they need to be put up for the night. So we've had several people sign up already. Um, if you've never housed kids from a program like this before, you'll be as blessed, if not more, than they are uh, by opening your home to them. So again, that's Sunday night, the 17th of June. There are sign-ups in the Narthex for that. We have several kids that still need houses. Please consider um, welcoming them to your house in those days. 
I don't have any other announcements to share with you, but we do have a special announcement. Mary, would you come forward? Mary Starkey is on the board with the House of Hope and comes to bring us greetings. Thank you, Pastor, and thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. As Pastor Mark said, my name is Mary Starkey, and I serve on the board of directors for the House of Hope Ministry. In March of 2014, I was blessed to come and speak with you about the amazing men of House of Hope. If you were here at that time, you may remember the video of the condemned buildings and how the program only had nine students. On that Saturday and Sunday, you all listened as we described our vision of churches coming together to restore the buildings, how we hope for volunteers to come and teach our students, for pastors to come and share the good news with them, and how we knew that something very special was happening at this ministry. That was our vision. Well, the pastors and Val and the staff and all the members of this church answered God's call in a way that we couldn't have imagined. How could we have known then that Mike and Frank and Jack and Chuck and all the other men and women of Hands of Hope, along with Jean and the volunteers from Helping Hands, would restore our buildings, in fact, more than restore them, and that AA and CR meetings would begin and musicians and speakers and pastors would come to our chapel services? In 2014, we only dreamed of the vegetable garden that Sandy and her volunteers would make a reality. And it was certainly beyond our wildest expectations that the council, led by Pete, and with the agreement from all of you, would purchase the property from our landlord and then rent it back to us for just $10 a year. We received added blessings when Len joined our House of Hope board as president and guided us until he uh, rotated off last month. And when Virginia came to work alongside Pastor Malcolm, to help with virtually every aspect of our ministry. And we give thanks for all that Bill Anderson did for this ministry while he was a part of our board. When we look back over the last four years, we realize that God had us walking down a path of his choosing. And we're here today to say that we're going to continue to walk down that path with him. As you all know from the announcement that Pastor Mark and Len made a few weeks ago, House of Hope will stay right where we are for the next 18 months. In fact, the students, with Chuck's help, just finished one of the buildings a week ago that will be used as their exercise and recreation center. This 18 months gives us time to find new land and, with God's grace, pursue a very large building fund and hopefully have all the living spaces we'll need for our students. Pastor Malcolm, Virginia, the rest of the staff, and all of the board are 100% committed to the House of Hope ministry. And we're equally committed to remaining in this area. We're not looking beyond Wildwood or Oxford for our new home. And when we find it, and we will, we'll make sure we have enough acreage for Sandy's garden and also to see another vision become a reality. That is, 50 students living on the campus at the same time all being healed through this program together. But just as it was in 2014, we have much to do. The gift of your time and talents has allowed us to pay off all of our previous debts and even save enough to start towards our financial goal. That in itself is a miracle, and I, I want to say it again because it was such a miracle. The gift of your time and talents has allowed us to pay off all of our debts and save enough to make a start toward our financial goal. There are no words to express our gratitude to our Heavenly Father for the blessings that He gave this ministry through the work of your hands. But we do thank you. We are so very grateful. And now, in 2018, we need your help just as we did then. So this is your formal invitation on behalf of our executive director, Pastor Malcolm, the staff, our board, and especially our students, to come and join us as we move forward. We're asking this of our current volunteers, and we'd also love to talk to any new volunteers who'd like to be a part of the future of this ministry. It is going to be awesome, and we can hardly wait to see God's plan unfold. 
Friday night, we had a celebration here at Hope Lutheran. We watched six men graduate from the one-year program. Three received their GED, and we recognized three others who are just weeks away from their own graduation. So many of their family members spoke to us during the reception about their son's journey. We met their wives. We saw their toddlers running all around Fellowship Hall. It was an evening of pure joy. And that was part of our vision, too, that healed and whole men would leave our campus and reunite with their families as believers and faithful members of our community. Just think of the difference that these 12 men are making in the lives of their family and, by extension, in our lives. That's why this ministry must continue, and that's why this ministry will continue. So I'm going to end the same way that I ended in 2014 with a quote sent to me by a friend. Attempt something so big that unless God intervenes, it's sure to fail. Well, we know now, almost four years to the day since we first came to this incredible church, that beyond any doubt, God intervened to bring together Hope Lutheran and House of Hope. And we know that he will continue to bless both ministries as we continue to serve him together. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Do you stand where you are and greet those around you in the love and peace of Christ? Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the life beyond all death, the joy beyond all sorrow, our light, our everlasting home. Amen. Rejoicing in Christ's victory over sin and death, let us come before God who calls us to repentance. God of life, you are the way of peace. Come into the brokenness of our lives and our land with your love. Help us to be willing to bow before you in true repentance and to bow to one another in real forgiveness. By the fire of your Holy Spirit, melt our hard hearts and consume the pride and prejudice which separates us. Fill us, O Lord, with your perfect love, which casts out our fear and binds us together in unity. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen.
Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together. Mighty God, you breathe life into our bones, and your spirit brings truth to the world. Send us the spirit, transform us by your truth, and give us language to proclaim your gospel through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The lesson of the day is from Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 21. The lesson begins. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be the tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Fugeria and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language, in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, hey, they had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. 
No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God sends, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billions of smoke, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on his name, calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated and let us pray. Now speak, Lord, in this moment while we wait on thee and hush our hearts to listen with expectancy. Amen. <clears throat> if we ask any of the pastors that are gathered here today as part of the service um, what it's like to prepare a sermon, especially one for a high holy day that you know is coming and you've, you've worked with the text before and there's familiarity with it, it can be a wonderful journey of preparing a sermon and knowing that it's what you should preach and that you have your illustrations lined up and you know it's going to work well or you really feel it's going to work well and to be prepared early in the week. That's how I felt on Thursday. I felt pretty confident about what I was preaching on today. And then Friday happened in our nation. And everything changed in that moment. It seemed like a normal day. I went to school and dropped Danny off as usual and listened to ESPN or something on the way back and got to the church. We had a meeting. I stopped to get co um, coffee on the way because I need to be proper, properly caffeinated for an early Friday morning meeting. And came into the meeting. We had the meeting, and I went home, and I just live a few minutes away, so I didn't even call on the way home. I just was going home so when I got there, we could uh, go out to lunch together with uh, me and Mary Jo. And I walked in the door and said, hey, honey, where do you want to go to lunch? And she said this line, did you hear about the school? Now, I'll tell you, if you'd said that to me four or five years ago, I would have thought maybe Florida State got a new quarterback or something great. Or I would have thought maybe something was going on at Danny's school. There's going to be an expansion. They're going to have a new campus or something. I don't know. But in the last several years, in the last several months, my heart and gut go to a different place. Maybe yours would too when you hear that line. And my next line said it all, I asked these questions, where and how many? Just where I go. And it shouldn't be that way, should it? Should we really be able to respond so easily in that manner? At the time, the death toll was only eight. And they spoke about it on some of the news channels as if we were lucky somehow to get by with only eight lives lost. Now ten. Ten dead, ten wounded, at least that shed blood, thousands wounded in their hearts, their souls, and their psyche. And then I made the horrible mistake of getting on social media and going on my phone because the TV wasn't updating fast enough, and I wanted the most up-to-date news. Isn't that what we all want, the real information? And I started scrolling, and I read the information we had on that. Then I made the mistake of scrolling down a little further to the next headline. Young woman, 40s, was a former playmate, uh, playmate centerfold or a playmate, playboy, playmate, play, am I saying right, playboy, playmate, whatever. It's probably good that I don't know that right. <laughs> she uh, was in a, a, a protracted custody battle with her estranged husband over their seven-year-old son. Uh, there was a lot of uh, nastiness involved and a lot of lawyers involved, and she wanted to take her son to Europe for summer, which sounds great, but... The attorneys involved said, absolutely not. You want to go stay with your boyfriend there, but we can't let the child leave uh, the country. You don't have custody of him. We don't know if that's the straw that broke the camel's back or not, but she checked into a hotel 
beautiful suite, major suite at a big downtown hotel in Manhattan, and somewhere in the evening decided that she should end her life by jumping and landing some 23 floors below and killing herself. And she took her seven-year-old son with her. I see, that's been the reaction in every service. It shouldn't sound like that's news to you. I mean, it was in the news. It was buried beneath the big stuff, the big uh, story that had more tragedy and more hurt and more bloodshed because we focus on the big things and get those headlines. But the reality is there's hurt and pain and atrocities everywhere in our world all the time. Now, I'm not going to get into politics and all those things. That's not what I'm ever really here to do. But I will say that there's something wrong when there's been about 20 school shootings this year. There's a lot of problems in our world, a lot of hurt, a, a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of fear. Oh, fear. And I feel like society does the best they can, especially the people with airwaves, to pump up that fear as often as they can. Every time a hurricane comes, anywhere near the state of Florida, we're terrified because it's the end of the world. Even if it's on the other coast off of California, sometimes I think it's going to jump over the United States and land on us. It's just the way they report it. Well, the disciples knew something about a spirit of fear. They knew something about a spirit of timidity, of caution. These folks who had walked with Jesus and heard from Him and witnessed His miracles and fed with Him and all these things. At this point, they've even witnessed Him risen from the dead, but there's still this, this fear within them. It's, it's hardwired into who they are and their humanity. You know, they were gathered in Jerusalem originally after Jesus died. They were gathered together in a locked room. Why? Because they were afraid. And now they're in another room in Jerusalem, ostensibly waiting for the gift of the Holy Spirit, but I think also somewhat fearful. I think that still was a part of who they were. And fear is an amazing demotivator. It can cause us to not do the right things. It can cause us to do the wrong things too. And I'm concerned because I believe that that is a spirit that still is within the church today. We're uncertain of what we should say or what we should do in society when there are problems, how we should act, how we should speak out. Can we really make a difference anyway? And if we say something, won't we just be some more of those crazy Christians that are always telling people how to live? Well, I think all that is addressed in some ways in our story of Pentecost today. The disciples are gathered together, and they're in a spirit of fear. How many of you have ever been afraid before? I'm afraid every time I walk in and out of my house. That sounds crazy, so let me explain that. We have shrubs that are along the walkway going into our front door that were all modeled in different sizes and cut differently, and I wanted them all pulled out, and the guy who does our lawn said, oh, I can save those. Give me some time. Sounds biblical. Give me some time to put some fertilizer around them and fix, spend some time on them. We'll see what you can do. And now they've grown up, and they're about uh, almost uh, probably mid-rib high on me, and they're vibrant, lush, young growth green and I hate them <laughs> because the black racers love them. And you know I don't like snakes. And I walk out the door and I go, <laughs> and sometimes the top of the bush goes, and they take off, and I suddenly find lots of reasons to be back inside. There's that kind of fear. But there's a different kind of fear. It's this fear now that I should never have understood. I understand a fear of snakes, and that's kind of biblical too. But the fear I have when I drop my son off at school in the mornings, when I tell him that I love him and that I'm proud of him and to make sure he does what the teacher says and behaves himself, all the important parent stuff. And then I drop him off. We have our own little saying we do and our little things we say goodbye with. And I, I drive away and I keep looking in the rearview mirror to watch him walk into the building because I said, I'll see you after school. And God, I pray it's true something wrong that a parent can think that way. There's something wrong that a Christian parent or a pastor has to think that way. Because the spirit of fear is not what we're called to. Look back at our scripture before us today. 
they're gathered in that room, and they have been fearful, they've been uncertain, and they don't really know what they're to do. They know they have a calling, but how are they ever going to make it happen? I mean, the world is an overwhelming place. It's, it's 12 plus, but we're going to count the 12. It's 12 against the world. That does not sound like good odds. But Jesus said, don't worry, there's one more that's going to be with you. He's on his way. Just, just wait a few minutes. And suddenly there's a rushing of wind, and there's flames that descend upon them, and they all start speaking in different languages. Something changes in that room. What happens? What comes? Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes in power upon them, and they are utterly transformed. Gone is their timidity. Gone is their uncertainty. Gone is their fear. The Spirit of God has replaced all of that. And they go out boldly and brashly and joyfully expressing the good news of the gospel, that Christ died for all people and rose for all people, especially they're saying it to the Jews who who say, but he died upon a tree and they have all their understandings. And Peter says, forget all of that. Don't you know how good this news is? Peter, Peter, patron saint of plausible deniability, Peter, that guy, is out there boldly and brashly saying, I stand with Jesus because Jesus stands with me. And they tell everybody who will listen. And, and all the reasons they have to be afraid are still there. People still want to get rid of them. People still don't like you messing in their business. All the things they were fearful of are still real. What changed was the spirit within them. I think we need to have a different understanding of the Holy Spirit today. Look at this nice little picture we have up here. Sometimes we have it in some of our other things like there. And when you see that, there's a bird over on the right-hand side or in our stained glass window that represents the Holy Spirit. It's used numerous times through Scripture. What kind of bird is that? Do we like doves? Sweet, gentle, wonderful cooing noise. Wouldn't you love to have the cooing of a dove to awake you in the morning as an alarm clock? So calm. You can just kind of effortlessly wake up and smoothly wake up. There's a reason why that's been a symbol for the church all these years, but it's not the only symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's not the only bird used to depict the Holy Spirit in the history of the church. The early Celtic Christians, my people in Scotland and Ireland, had a very different bird in mind when they thought of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't the gentle dove. It was the wild goose. Have you ever experienced a wild goose before? Would you want a wild goose to wake you up in the morning as an alarm clock? Braying and annoying and abrasive and jarring, and they won't be quiet. They also, if you get in their space, let you know you shouldn't be there. You should be somewhere else. They will chase you and nip at you and honk at you and drive you forward. They can make life amazingly uncomfortable. That's the image the early Celtic church had of the Holy Spirit. And I think they're on to something. I think sometimes there's the peaceful, calm, quiet, renewing Holy Spirit. Stephen experienced that while he was being martyred and saw um, Christ sitting at the right hand of God and was so calm and serene and praying for those. But Paul, who was also there, he experienced the braying, honking of the Spirit on the road to Damascus. Peter and the others, I think, on Pentecost were waiting for that joy, that peace, that hope that would come from the Holy Spirit. But what happened was the Spirit came in and it drove them out. They could do nothing else but proclaim the gospel. This is Pentecost. It's the day we celebrate the history of that event. It's the day we celebrate what it is to be the church in the world. The church empowered and driven by the Holy Spirit. Where's our zeal and our passion and our lust for speaking out the word of Christ? Where is the, devel- the conviction that we are to do so in the midst of a broken world? How is it that the spirit of fear and uncertainty can so overwhelm us? And fear leads to uncertainty and fear leads to uh, damaging relationships and fear leads to separation from others and fear leads to all sorts of categories we put people in. Fear can do a lot of things to us. Fear brings death in the church. Something happened in that room to the fear they felt. I think Peter puts his finger on it later around verse 40 and following in the same chapter. 
when he's been preaching to all the people and he tells them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to trust in what God's done through him. And then they say to him, well, what are we supposed to do? And he says, repent. It's a big word we use a lot. Repent means simply to turn. It means you're going this way, you're here, you find yourself in a place where God doesn't want you, and you turn around back to where God wants you to be. But here's the kicker. You can't know you need to repent without the Spirit urging you. And you can't even turn around without the giftedness of the Spirit to enable you. And no matter what you do, you can't get back over on the right track. It's not like you're a car that drove off course. It's like you're a derailed train. The only way to get back there is for God to pick you up and place you there and put you where God wants you to be. And we have to be open and willing for God to enable that in our lives. I think he's able to proclaim repentance and transformation in the world because it's also about being transformed to become the likeness of Christ, the mind of Christ, as Paul calls it, that we're called to that. I think Peter was able to proclaim that with great gusto because he was already living it himself. When we call the world to repentance and transformation and we ourselves are not repentant and transformed people, it sounds like a lie. And there are a lot of people that use the word repent to blame and shame other people when it always is supposed to begin at home. We all have brokenness. So often that comes out in response in tragic events as us wanting to lay blame or accuse or make excuses or separate from other people and, and find why these things happen rather than admitting that we have a problem of sin in the whole world and brokenness everywhere. John Wesley said that there can be no social holiness, no social transformation without personal transformation and personal holiness beginning in the church. And vice versa, if anyone is transformed by the Spirit of God, if anyone has new life in the Spirit, then there's no way they can live in the world and not just want it to be changed, but to make it change. So I'm going to ask you the same thing I've asked many times, and I'll ask it a lot over the next year. It's going to kind of be a mantra for me. How many of you would like to see the world changed? How many of you want to change? A few more hands than last time, not many more. You know, the change has to begin to, with us if we want the world to change too. A young woman by the name of Sally figured that out when she was in seminary. She was taking another class with a professor who was kind of a mixed deal. He was both a professor who did very interesting, fun things in class. It made it a lot of fun to be in there, but he was also a really, really hard grader. And she had experienced in the semester before the fun, but also had not gotten the grade she thought she deserved. She was a little, a little upset about that. So she walked into class with the rest of the class. They were murmuring. She knew something must be going on. And when she walked in, there where the chalkboard was was a giant piece of paper that had been taped up to the chalkboard, and on it was drawn a big bullseye. She thought, oh, here he goes again. The professor came in and said, oh, I see you noticed the uh, paper on the wall. Well, here's what that's about. He said, you know, we're all uh, people who carry around things within us that, that are, are hurtful, you know, people who have hurt us, people who anger us, people who get under our skin, people who annoy us. Some of them might be very familiar names to everyone. Some of them might be names known only to you. He says, what I'd like us to do today in class is I'd like us to go up there and, and draw a representation of that person somewhere on the paper. Take the time to do that. Now, he asked me to do it in class. I want you, just for a moment in your mind, to think of that person in your life. That person that annoys you, gets under your skin, rubs you the wrong way, famous or not, just somebody who, who troubles you, someone who you get angry with, someone who you find yourself separated with and find ways to define that you're different than them. And then after they were all done, you know, she was at the back of the class. She was the one of the last ones to draw. She uh, had a little bit more artistic ability, and she started drawing, and she realized she was drawing a pretty good caricature of the actual professor of the class there on the paper. And then he had them starting in the front again, go back up, and he opened a box. He said, now, let's just take out our feelings of aggression, our feelings of, of all the negativity we have. And he opened up the box full of darts. And he had them all throw darts at the dartboard that he had made. And they laughed at first, kind of half-heartedly. Then they really got into it. He said, don't just try for the bullseye. Try for the picture of the person that you drew up there. And they got really into it. As I started moving through the class, they were almost to the back row where she was sitting. And the professor noted the time and said, okay, we have to finish. I know some of you didn't get to go. That really upset her. She really wanted to throw a dart at that picture now. 
And he said, oh, one more thing before we go. And he went up and he took down the paper off of the chalkboard and they found posted there behind it revealed a portrait of Christ that was destroyed by all the darts. And he turned to the class and he read this quote from Matthew 25. It's Jesus speaking about caring for the least and lost in the world. He reappropriated this text. He read just this line to them. Inasmuch as you have done it unto these, the least of my brothers and sisters, you have done it unto me, class dismissed. But nobody left. Nobody moved. There was just a sound of breathing. They just needed to dwell with where they were, convicted by the Spirit, and seek repentance and forgiveness and transformation in that place. And God, I wish we could just sit here and dwell on it today as well, but you have lunches to go to in a few minutes. But here's the good news. The same Spirit that dwells with us here in this moment is the same Spirit that goes out those doors with us. It's the same Spirit that calls us to radical transformation personally and culturally as a congregation and in the world around us, that without that transformation, without that conviction, without us being fully dependent on God's grace and knowing what good news it is because we need it so badly, that without that, we won't share because it's a fearful place in the world. It's a place that makes it all too easy not to be what God has called us to be. But the world has great need. You don't have to look far to find out what that need is. By Lermo, California, the Benedictine monks figured it out. They converted a 400-acre ranch into a religious community called St. Andrew's Priory. And as you enter the grounds, you find the land is posted. You've seen that before on private property. The post says, no hunting. You ever seen a sign like that? No hunting. But then in smaller words, it says, except for peace. The world is hunting for peace. Perhaps some of you are today. But thanks be to God, the Prince of Peace himself found us out. We don't have to find peace. Peace sought us out. And we have that, we should be encouraged by that and filled by a spirit that makes us bold to proclaim the good news to others so the world might be changed. The disciples filled with that spirit that day began to preach and proclaim and to teach and to live differently than the world. It was countercultural to the point that those that didn't understand them said, they've come here and turned the world upside down. I just pray we'll do it again. Let us pray. Almighty God, as you come into our hearts this day, purge from us all of those things that hold us back from being the people you call us to be, from being the church called out in the world to proclaim the good news that Christ rose, that Christ died for all people. Lord, that repentance is not just for those people that we don't like out there, that it starts with us. That forgiveness, grace, mercy, hope, are not for us alone, they're for the world. And Lord, may our lives be defined by those characteristics and not by fear, not by complacency or timidity or by desire to, to not offend, but simply by being called to the truth and to the grace of the gospel. Lord, start with us here. Renew your church in this place. May this be a new Pentecost for us. We pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Empowering God, you gave the church the abiding presence of your Holy Spirit. Look upon your church today and hear our petition. God of wind and fire, on this Pentecost Sunday, we are more aware than ever of our deep need for you. It's true. We don't know how to pray. We don't know how to form on our lips the words to express the prayer that lingers on our hearts. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, comforter, teacher, inspiration, and translator of every soul's deepest need. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, we come to you in prayer filled with awe at the way you move in our lives. No tongue of fire is too small to spread your goodness. No breath too insignificant to speak your truth. Each day contains its holy moments, a constant reminder of your Spirit's presence. Fill us, we pray, with your Holy Spirit, that we may know your fire of love deeply in our being. May we be your love. May we bring your love. May your love reign as we rejoice with you this day. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Spirit, how is it that we each hear your whispering our names with an unrestrained holiness and a prophetic heart you whisper, and in gratitude we hear you and understand. Help us to always listen for your voice and hear when you call us by name, Lord, in your mercy. Father God, you know the desires of our hearts, and know the prayers in our hearts, but not yet on our lips. Be with those who have asked us to pray for them, for those who can't remember any longer, and the people who care for them, those struggling with a new diagnosis and the family that surrounds them. We especially remember the many victims of this week's school shooting and the victims of all violence, too numerous to name all those difficult things in our lives that your whispered peace can soothe, we ask for in our hearts now, aloud, or on our lips. Lord, in your mercy. Father, grant that gathered and directed by your Spirit, we may confess Christ as Lord and combine our diverse gifts with a singular passion to continue his mission in this world until we join in your eternal praise with all the saints that have gone before us and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed a good and joyful thing that we should always and everywhere give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, according to whose most true promise the Holy Spirit came down as at this time from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them and to lead them into all truth, whereby we have been brought out of darkness into the clear light and the true knowledge of thee. And so with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, saying that this is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, Jesus' life and ministry, his call for us to follow his death and resurrection, we lift this bread and cup before you, O God, giving thanks that you have made us your servant people. And we ask that you send your spirit upon these gifts of your church to gather into one all who share in this sacrament. Fill us with your spirit that we may praise and glorify you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Please join hands as a community. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The disciples knew the Lord Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Come to this table where you are known and loved. You may be seated.
Please stand. Loving God, by your spirit we are born anew, and you nourish us like newborns with this holy food, by which we grow into salvation. Give us grace to live as you arisen sons and daughters, shining in the world with your marvelous light, and to gather all creation to the heavenly table, where Christ reigns in glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Go in peace, share the good news.